Excuse us, we have a dance. Tonight on a special edition of 2020. Manic depressive. Yes, she was born that way. Got it from Eddie. Eddie's side. Debbie and Carrie, a Hollywood love story. I always feel, as a mother does, that I protect her. Who will do that when I'm gone? The double tragedy saying goodbye yeah. twice, just a day apart. Brother and son Todd there at the end, speaking only to 2020. I was on her bed with her, and I watched her leave and go to Carrie. It sounds like you're saying she willed herself to die. She didn't die from a broken heart. She just left to be with Carrie. Growing up in the shadow of a screen legend. Good morning, good morning. A daughter it's feeling crazy. inferior. I haven't lost my mind, it lost me. And my mother was really pretty and I thought, oh no, I don't look like her. I better have another thing going for me. Their indelible but turbulent bond portrayed on screen in postcards from the edge. I did not lift including my that guy Michael. Skirt. It's world up! but off screen in silence. I didn't want to be around her. I did not want to be Debbie Reynolds' daughter. She didn't talk to me for probably 10 years. Tonight, home videos you've never seen. Oh, we leave for the home tomorrow. Oh, I've days. already been oh, in it. And stories you've never heard about two unsinkable survivors. That ship may be down, but not me. I'm unsinkable. It's magical, the love story that went on for 60 years. It's okay, because now I'm Princess Leia's mother, so I'm really here. The memories they've left behind for all of us. Happy days are here again. Good evening. I'm Elizabeth Vargas in Los Angeles. David is away. As you can see, I'm looking down on the fabled Hollywood Boulevard, where movie fans have been laying tributes at the Walk of Fame star of Debbie Reynolds. In the last few days, it has become a makeshift memorial for both mother and her daughter, Carrie Fisher, unbelievably dying just one day apart. And a few hours ago, I spoke to Todd Fisher, Carrie's brother and Debbie's son, about their very last hours and the end of a Hollywood era. One week ago, Todd Fisher thought his sister was on top of the world. At the top of her game, she looked beautiful. Her hair looked beautiful. She had wonderful, you know, her. she was back in shape. Carrie Fisher! She was in London promoting her latest book and preparing to come home to Los Angeles for the holidays. When was the last time you spoke to your sister? Just literally before she left England. Was she excited about this trip, this yeah, book tour? Yeah, well, no, she was excited about Christmas. Her favorite thing to do was to give out gifts. When it came to economics, you know, she's not ever interested in the deal, but she always had the most amazing gifts for everybody. You know, the 935 Heavy, I need the nature of the, uh, the medical emergency. But on that flight, just 15 minutes before landing, the iconic actress suffered a massive heart attack. We have an unresponsive passenger. So they're working on it right now. A mid-air medical emergency for actress Carrie Fisher. How did you hear that something had happened to Carrie on board that flight, just as it was coming into land? You know, I had a phone call from my mother's house and said that something's happened with Carrie, and, you know, so we obviously all got into high alert. Was she um, alone? She was did, never alone. Did people help her? Of course. She had amazing help, and she, you know... The, from what I understand on the airplane, you know, she had doctors right there immediately and everything was done. You all rushed to the hospital when you got that phone call? When you got there, was Carrie there yet? Yes, Carrie was there. We thought we might be able to save her, uh, you know, and that was in, in play for a little while. But the doctor always said that it, it was, you know, high risk. And so, you know, it was not something that... Uh, was a, f a sure thing by any means. She's Star Wars royalty. Now Carrie Fisher is in the intensive care unit. Your mom had issued a statement saying yes. at one point that she was stable, and I think a lot of people had a lot of hope at that point. Now what she meant by that, because I was with her, is she, you know, she's stable in ICU. Now I mean, being stable in ICU means you're, you're stable in ICU. You're, you're still in critical condition. So that never changed. She was on life support. Yeah, she was always critical and. You know, my mother always felt that she, you know, had already sort of left the building, so to speak. That was her feelings, but that she had hope. We all have hope. My mother has great 
very strong faith. She's she's a strong belief in, in God and has always talked to God in a real personal way. And that's part of what her strength was about. Did your mother have the chance at Carrie's bedside before she died to be able to gather around it? Was the family able to have a moment? Yes, everybody had that. But at the same time, you know, things didn't need to be said or done differently. I, I was, it had all been said before and it was all in place. Nothing else needed to happen. Things happen naturally is what I'm saying. It must have been excruciating for your mother to lose your sister. It violates the order of nature to lose a child. The last few days is, that led up to the, the losing Carrie, my mother had a few moments where she was clearly distraught, but 99% of the time, she sucked it up. And then what happened that last day? I think the most important thing that happened is Carrie left. And when Carrie left, my mother had many years ago said, I don't want to attend my daughter's funeral. There was really no grief in her like you would might expect. It wasn't that she was sitting around and just unconsolable, not at all. She then said that she really wanted to be with Carrie. In she those, said that. In those precise words. And within 15 minutes from that conversation, she faded out. And within 30 minutes, she technically was gone. What do you mean faded out? I mean, she started to have a stroke and she just effectively went to sleep and didn't wake up. She closed her eyes peacefully like you're going to sleep and she literally went to sleep and left. Beloved and legendary actress Debbie Reynolds has died at age 84. She willed herself to die. I'm saying that my mother, if anybody, had somehow a way to do that and I watched it happen in front of my face. What did that look like? She literally just went to sleep and left. And, you know, we obviously went through all the motions, you know, to get her, try to bring her back and all that. And we didn't know we couldn't do that. I just sat there and watched her leave. And you know what? That's what makes it okay. If it was something else, I wouldn't be okay. The fact that she's with Carrie, you know, and taking care of her, which is what she loved most. The two of them, Carrie obviously had more needs in many ways. And my mother loved that helping her and watching after her and was was brilliant at it but also obsessed with it and Carrie on the other hand was also equally obsessed with taking care of my mother that's what the beauty of this is the love story is uncanny and to exit the planet it makes Romeo and Juliet look like soft stuff I mean it was unbelievable this is horrible but it's beautiful it's 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 life I mean and it's it's what they what she wanted and because of that, I'm, I hope we're all okay with that because that's where Debbie wanted to be. She had a will to not want to leave Carrie and, and not want to have Carrie alone. And also I think she'll be of great assistance in heaven with Carrie because Carrie's really, really tough to handle at times. And my mother was amazing. You think Carrie's making a, oh, a scene sure, up there? <laughs> I'm sure they're all... I mean, initially, she was there for a while on her own. I'm, I'm almost thinking maybe God had a little chat with mom and said, get up here and give us a hand. Todd says mother and daughter will be buried at the famed Forest Lawn Cemetery, a California hillside full of industry royalty, from Michael Jackson to the Marx Brothers to the man who made Mickey Mouse. Will they be buried next to each other? They will be buried next to each other. And we're going to go to Forest Lawn, where her other friends are, Liberace, Betty Davis, was a great friend of my mom. They made the movie Cater to Fair and became friends. Mm -hmm. And Betty's buried in the same area where Debbie's gonna go. And right on the other side of this wall is where Liberace is, who is a close friend of my mom. And his mother is also there. So it'll be a double funeral? We'll have a private funeral with mm -hmm. friends and family together, mm -hmm. which is how they would want it. And then we'll figure something out for the public. Their life is high class stuff. And these were high class broads very high class and so they deserve to be remembered and discussed in this fashion it's horrible it's beautiful it's magical they're together it's just it's beyond words it's beyond understanding but i saw it and it is what it is you can't deny it it, it is what it is when we return america's sweetheart debbie reynolds and her husband eddie fisher 
who left her for Elizabeth Taylor. Brangelina or Kim and Kanye. This story was three times that in magnitude. And later, more family memories from Todd Fisher. A lot of friction. But no one's running away from it. Next. It is one of the most famous opening shots on film. Singing in the rain, just singing in the rain. What a glorious view, and we're happy again. And in the middle of the cloudburst, a star is born. The girl in the big galoshes, Debbie Reynolds, marching through the raindrops and into our hearts. The story of her early career leading up to that movie is so incredible, we'll let her tell it herself. Here she is in an appearance that aired just last year during the Screen Actors Guild Awards. I was only 16 and still Mary Frances Reynolds when I entered the Miss Burbank contest. I did it as a lark to get a blouse and a scarf that they were giving away to all the contestants. Well, as fate would have it, in a year, I was under contract to the biggest studio in Hollywood. She was born Mary Frances Reynolds in El Paso, Texas. Her father later moved the family to California. Her aspirations at the time might surprise you. My mother grew up in Burbank, went to Burbank High, you know, was a batonist and uh, 27 merit badges and the Girl Scouts. She thought she was going to be a gym teacher. Fortunately for all of us, she wound up making movies instead. That first leading role came when she was just 19. Good morning. It's great. She had never danced professionally. She always said Gene Kelly never liked her because he wanted a professional dancer in that part. He didn't want to work with a beginner. MGM gave her a three-month crash course, and then it was up to her to hold her own without falling on her face. Not basically a dancer, thrown into this part as the ingenue in it, and boy, she kept up with them. She was a revelation. She was really young. It was sort of like when we saw Jennifer Lawrence for the first time, and she was just so amazing and breathtaking, and we fell in love with her. There would be other movies, more than 30 of them. In 1955, she was the girl who caught Frank Sinatra in The Tender Trap. I could go to the license bureau and be married and then have a baby, and. I have another baby in the country. Todd Fisher says between takes, his mom got some sage advice from Sinatra. He said, whatever you do, Debbie, do not marry a singer. Reynolds ignored Sinatra's warning. She married a crooner named Eddie Fisher, who was famous for serving up pop, both carbonated and musical, on his television show, Coke Time. May I sing? The newlyweds shared the bill in the musical Bundle of Joy in 1956. Would it interest you to know I'm not the mother? Reynolds was the mother in real life. She was already pregnant during filming with their first child, daughter Carrie. A son, Todd, followed two years later. Reynolds' screen credits included some serious dramatic parts, like The Catered Affair in 1956. I'll never forget the look on her face when I told her we weren't having a big wedding. I'll never forget the way she looked. Like I'd hit her in the face. The high notes came in films where she played the good girl, such as Tammy and The Bachelor. Tammy, Tammy, Tammy's in love. The title song became a hit record. But even with those successes, her talent was underappreciated. And I don't think it's been until kind of after the fact that people have looked at her work and said, oh my God, she was great. When a contract dispute kept Shirley MacLaine from playing the unsinkable Molly Brown, Debbie threw herself into the role. I'm gonna learn to read. Her favorite role was Molly Brown. Why did she like that one so much? Because it's her. My mother is Molly Brown. She loved that part. She wanted that part. She fought for that part. She got the part. She knocked the out of the park. It also brought her an Academy Award nomination. Debbie Reynolds in The Unthinkable Molly Brown. Although it was Julie Andrews who took home the Oscar for Mary Poppins. 
Between projects, Reynolds began making stage appearances in Las Vegas. This black and white photo, widely shared on social media, shows a six-year-old Carrie watching her mother perform in Las Vegas in the early 60s. Now go to sleep. Memorably, Reynolds was the voice of the kind and nurturing spider in the 1973 animated classic, Charlotte's Web. What is your name, please? My name is Charlotte. Charlotte A. Cavatica. I have a delicious surprise. It's a very special cake. I want you kiddies to have the first piece. But this was her iconic role, and this may have been her iconic song. Good morning, good morning. We've gabbed the whole night through. Good morning, good morning to you. Nothing could be grander than to be in Louisiana. If you think you've heard that too recently, you may be right. Good morning, good morning. It lives on as the jingle for Tropicana orange juice. As with so many Hollywood lives, however, it was something that happened off screen that drew the most attention. Theirs was a very famous marriage and it was a very famous divorce. Reynolds and Fisher were close friends with Elizabeth Taylor and her husband. But when he died in a plane crash, Eddie began comforting the future star of Cleopatra and didn't stop. If you can think of the most popular and buzzed about tabloid stories of our day, Brangelina or Kim and Kanye, this story was three times that in magnitude. They were the golden couple of their era. And so when he left her for Elizabeth Taylor, very publicly, all of the sympathy in the entire world went to Debbie Reynolds. Not just because she had been left by her husband and she was a beloved movie star, but also he had left her for Elizabeth Taylor, who was like Jezebel. There was an awkward encounter between the women at a fundraiser in 1965. And the presence of Debbie and Elizabeth Taylor at the same affair led to some nervous anticipation. There would be serious financial difficulties for Reynolds and two more failed marriages. Who has had more public difficulties than my mother? She's been through husbands and fortunes. If it wasn't for the husbands, she wouldn't have been through the fortunes. But she's ridden it all out with amazing grace and all in the public eye. From Hollywood to Broadway and then Vegas. Ladies and gentlemen, Miss Debbie Reynolds. Where by the 1970s, she was making appearances like this one with Liberace. Your But it is her early work, those technicolor, melt-in-your-mouth cinematic confections that will stand the test of time. Ladies and gentlemen, stop that girl. That girl running up the aisle, stop her. That's the girl whose voice you heard and loved tonight. She's the real star of the picture. Debbie's really the last of an era. She's our last star from that era of the 40s and 50s. She's our last connection to Singing in the Rain, maybe the best musical ever made. The world would grow to appreciate Debbie Reynolds' other gifts as well, including that little girl watching in the wings. The daughter of Hollywood royalty will become a princess in her own right. I don't know what you're talking about. A star from a galaxy far, far away. Carrie Fisher is about to take center stage. Stay with us. Fisher's life began similar to how it would end, with intense public interest and a camera's eyes fixed upon her. Here she is in some rare Fisher home movies, hula dancing. Though the daughter of two celebrities, she was raised by her single mother, Debbie Reynolds, whose nomadic show business lifestyle forced Fisher to drop out of high school. I wanted to do what my mother did. I wanted to be like my mother. I worship my mother. I was in my mother's nightclub act when I was 13 years old. So I was sort of groomed to be flinging my cords and wowing them in Vegas. And she would wow them in Hollywood as well. Always full of moxie, Fisher pursued her own dreams of stardom. Appearing alongside Warren Beatty in 1975 satirical romantic comedy Shampoo at the tender age of 17. Are you? My what? What are you doing? Making it with my mother. Then, two years later, Fisher auditioned for the role that would change her life. When R2 has been safely delivered to my forces, you get your award. And change the world. 
Princess Leia in Star Wars, who wittily dodged danger again and again. Somebody has to save our skins. I was with Carrie when we first went to the Star Wars screening. She thought it was a B movie because she was just in front of a green screen or blue screen in those days. That ship flew over. I looked at her and I said, this is no B movie. And her life was never the same. Though she played a super heroine, Fisher told my co-winger David Muir in 2015, she was super nervous that she didn't look the part. Help me, Obi-Wan Kenobi. You're my only hope. Princess Leia really inspired young girls. Right from but the start. But not her... to be pretty. <laughs> but but, no, but what... she was really pretty. I no, mean... no, no. She, and sh yes, and I didn't know that. She proved to be a Princess Leia who was feisty and indomitable, who gave as good as she got. This is on rescue. Came in here. Did you have a plan for getting out? Star Wars quickly became an international sensation and made Fisher an instant pop icon, just like her mother had been 25 years earlier. Fisher followed up the first Star Wars film with this. A day of joy we all can share. Channeling her mother's musical talents, though the Star Wars holiday special of 1977 was universally panned. Yet Fisher soldiered on with more movies like The Blues Brothers with the skillful yet self-destructive John Belushi. It was a box office success, but behind the scenes, there was a secret between the co-stars. Belushi and I did drugs together. And I remember him saying, you and I were alike. And then he was dead like a year later. Fisher too had begun a descent into drugs. If I went to someone's house, I was always going through their cabinets, and you know, I was, I said I was Robin Hood. I took from the straight and gave to the potentially stone. The public had no idea. She reprised her role as Princess Leia in two Star Wars sequels in 1980 and 1983. I became not a movie star, but I became my character. Princess Leia was more famous than I was. So I felt like a has-been at 25. Feeling somehow rejected by Hollywood, Fisher told Diane Sawyer she went on a four-year drug binge, though she did land the occasional role. When filming When Harry Met Sally... I've got the perfect guy. I don't happen to find him attractive, but you might. She doesn't have a problem with chins. She seemed perfectly fine by day, but... Stayed up late, snorted heroin. That's nice. My mother will be so proud. It would be warmer if we share. Under the Rainbow is the one where I was completely crazy. I was on drugs. I started losing a lot of weight. Fisher says hallucinatory drugs brought a kind of rest to her fevered brain. And I bought this house because I thought that it would look good on acid and it would be great for parties. <laughs> I felt normal on acid. So LSD brought you down. I, it just gave me visuals. So each day you'd wake up and you'd decide what you needed that day in order to feel what? Less. Just feel less. In 1983, she once again follows her mother's blueprint and marries a singer, Paul Simon, whose talent helped ground his high-voltage bride for a while, at least. One of the things I really liked about Paul, any words that have a certain rhythm are very soothing to me. What's the song that he sings that most took you? Kathy, I'm lost, I said, though I knew she was sleeping. Kathy, I'm lost, I said, though I knew she was sleeping. I'm aching and empty and I don't know why. I'm empty and aching and I don't know why. The marriage was short-lived. Fisher was linked to several other A-listers. Men were drawn to her because she was a fascinating person to be around. She was engaged to Dan Aykroyd for a brief period of time. We got the blood test and the rings and the whole thing, and then we didn't get married. She also had a relationship with the CAA agent Brian Lord, which produced a daughter, Billy. And she had an affair with Harrison Ford at the beginning of the making of Star Wars. All these things are true because she's told them to us. It was Aykroyd who she credits with getting her off cocaine, but she didn't stay clean for long. At one point, she says she was taking 30 pills of the painkiller Percodan every day to try to mellow out her manic state. You were married to Paul Simon at one time. You're kidding. Yes. <laughs> oh, my God. Well, that's incredible. 
<laughs> no one knew that the real issue wasn't so much the drugs, but rather an average day inside Carrie Fisher's mind. I'm manic depressive. Does it terrify you to say that? No. No. It's, I own it. I'm mentally ill. I haven't lost my mind. It lost me. While her film career stalled, she appeared in these poem movies that capture her condition. It is like a 24-hour carnival ride, her monologues, an attempt to silence the roar. You know when you make the statement you can't contain yourself? That's how I feel all the time. Not all the time. Certainly I wish I felt that way all the time. And yet, You can't I stop. Very painful. It's raw. You know, it's, it's, it's rough. But it's a feeling of having been poured too much personality, it then spills out. Your eyes, your mouth. And it's humorous barbs that spilled out. 11 years ago at this AFI tribute slash roast for Star Wars creator George Lucas. Hi, I'm Mrs. Han Solo and I'm an alcoholic. <clears throat> I'm an alcoholic because George Lucas ruined my life. Where she finally let it all fly about her love-hate relationship with the role of the royal rebel which came to define her career. George is a sadist. <laughs> but like any abused child wearing a metal bikini changed to a giant slug about to die, <clears throat> I keep coming back for more. So, happily ever after. No such animal. No, it's just... What is it then? What's the adjective? Everything ever after. Next, the family secrets a daughter would share on the big screen. I drink socially. I took acid socially. That would cause a decade-long silence. She didn't talk to me for probably 10 years. Stay with us. In many ways, Carrie Fisher's life was her art. I don't want life to imitate art. I want life to be art. But she was a realist. So in her 20s, Fisher turned her tumultuous real-life stories into best-selling novels. Her first was Postcards from the Edge, which was made into a film in 1990. In this town, it's not only not... You can't grow old gracefully. You can't grow old at all. So uh, you can as a writer. It was about a young actress raised by a movie star who had ended up in rehab. I'm in a rehab? The parallels between Meryl Streep's character, Suzanne, and Fisher are unmistakable. Do you always talk in bumper stickers? You know, addiction isn't the problem, it's the solution. You do. And until you remove in Postcards from the Edge, the mother is played by Shirley MacLaine. This anger isn't about me. Who are you really angry with? Mm. Hello, darling. Hello, dear. Oh. Hi, Mama. She clearly was a, we would call a kind of Ramana Clay of her relationship with, uh, with her mother, Debbie Reynolds, and uh, at the same time, very frank about her own struggles. I'm going to kill myself. Don't say that, even in jest, Suzanne. Just come out of a drug clinic. People might take it the wrong way. Oh. In the film, both mother and daughter are actresses. While her daughter's career is poised to take off, the mother's star has faded, yet still she grasps for the limelight. It is some of the best dialogue, the best repartee that, that you will see on, on a screen outside of those old His Girl Friday kind of zinger comedies. Remember my 17th birthday party when you lifted your skirt up in front of all those I people? I did not lift including my that guy skirt, Michael. it twirled up! And you weren't wearing any underwear. Well, good times and dumb times, I've seen them all in my dear. I am still here. When she does the Sondheim song, I'm still here. That's, that was Debbie. Yeah. And, and Carrie understood that and I think in many ways resented it and adored it. Turner Classic Movies host Robert Osborne was friends with Debbie Reynolds for more than 40 years and co-hosted a film review show called The Essentials with Carrie Fisher. One of my favorite scenes in the movie is 
when they're in a kitchen in the morning. Shirley MacLaine's, you know, lecturing her about getting serious about her life and her career. Thank God I got sober now so I could be hyper-conscious for this series of humiliations. All the while she's making a health food drink. She reaches up, gets a bottle of vodka, you know, and pours it in a health food drink. I think that Debbie Reynolds often said she was not like that character that Shirley MacLaine would play in the movie adaptation because that woman was sort of angry and Debbie thought of herself as very sunny. I was born very up. I don't burden myself. Carrie burdens herself. In this interview from 1994, Reynolds explains the sage advice she had for her daughter. As far as happiness and approach to life, there is something to listen to me about. And when she wants to, she'll ask me. I don't think I'll be alive to hear it, but... <laughs> In 2011, the two spoke to Oprah about those years during Fisher's youth when she rebelled against her famous mother. We had a fairly volatile relationship early on in my 20s. I didn't want to be around her. I did not want to be Debbie Reynolds' daughter. It's very hard when your child doesn't want to talk to you, but when you want to talk to them and you want to touch them, you want to hold them. It was a total estrangement. The birth of Fisher's daughter, Billy, in 1992 would help heal all the wounds in their relationship. I love you. While Fisher enjoyed success in her writing work, Reynolds' career got a boost in television. Come on, girls, jump in. Ma, there's no singing here. It's great to stay up late. Good morning, good morning to you. And she would have one last movie role herself as, yes, a mother, Liberace's. All I need is to be near you. She had really transformed herself to play this character. But look how much I love. No, I know. It was a brief and final testament to what an amazingly underrated, brilliant actress Debbie Reynolds was. While Debbie transformed herself, Carrie was about to revisit an old friend. Some things never change. True. You still drive me crazy. She had so triumphantly returned to the Princess Leia character. And in her own personal health, she looked better than ever. And daughter Billy was all grown up. Her daughter was in that movie as well. It was kind of neat to see mother and daughter together, seeing them on the red carpet together in the same movie. Princess Leia! Her greatest accomplishment is Billy. It was her greatest joy, it was her greatest accomplishment. I do believe that Billy Lord was the love of Carrie's life. She was very close with her daughter. I believe she probably worked at that consciously because of all of the things that she went through with her own mother. I believe she wanted to be all things to Billy. Billy in the bleachers. The mother-daughter, granddaughter trio made their last public appearance together a year ago when Debbie was honored at the SAG Awards with the Lifetime Achievement Award. To my mother! Coming up, Todd Fisher talks about the moving tributes from fans around the world, including this picture of his mother and sister in their most famous roles. Heaven, mommy, mommy, I'm in heaven. My sister and my mother had a very unique relationship. It's magical, the love story that, that went on for 60 years. There were many ups and downs, but not, not at the heart level. Debbie and Carrie, mother and daughter. A love so fierce, it sometimes burned. Money, money, I'm home. The soon-to-be-released HBO documentary Bright Lights chronicles their you tempestuous relationship. You cannot keep that phone. It's ridiculous. What was it like, though, for you? You had the front row seat to it. As it Just was your mother and sister. I mean, did they have epic no. battles? No, it's a. It's a. I said it's. A, it was a glorious view of an amazing love story. Did they talk about why they, for ten years, barely communicated? What happened to cause that? Debbie, first of all, would have never broken off communications with Carrie under any circumstances whatsoever. There was this friction there but but it's you know friction but no one's hearts. running away from it nobody's saying let's not have this moment mm -hmm. they had more moments than anybody could have had they were equally up to the task of 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 working it all out i'm gonna go help my mother pack they were the closest of friends and next door neighbors mother and i live next door to each other separated by one daunting hill i usually come to her 
And at the end, we're sharing a driveway? Right. Do they see each other daily? Sure. We sort of have this, this compound mentality. And so that's why she really wanted to be there. And also that had to do with Billy. She wanted to be near her granddaughter growing up. And so she just literally bought the house next to Carrie and it became... Did she tell Carrie first or did she just buy the house next to Carrie? That's a good question. I think it just sort of happened. And that was also a kind of a really beautiful thing that they could be together at that level. And, you know, in order to get out of Carrie's property, you have to go by my mom. And so, you know, on your way out, you'd walk in and see how mom's doing. And, and they, you know, my mom would, uh, they had a lot of that going on. Their relationship was at the heart of Carrie's most personal writing project, Wishful Drinking, a raw, candid portrait of the tensions between mother and daughter. There's nothing more that can be said and nobody better to say it than Carrie. Every bit of Carrie's life, every problem Carrie ever had is in writing and, and in beautiful words that are beyond deep, beyond profound. The frankness and level to which she has exposed herself in life is, is truly remarkable. The self-deprecating autobiography became a hit Broadway show. Over here, we have Debbie and Eddie. Listen as she maps out the six degrees that separates Hollywood. To sort of figure out if her daughter, Billy Lore, could date a guy, Quinn Tibby, one of the descendants of Elizabeth Taylor, and would it be incest? Are they related? I think she discovered no, it would not be. I told them, you are related by scandal. <laughs> There's a great photo going around of Carrie sitting in the wings watching your mother perform on stage. Yes. You guys... We were... always were sitting in the wings watching my mother on stage in awe. She connected with an audience. It was just an amazing thing to watch. But it was a little surreal as a child because you know mommy and there's a different thing going on there. And then when she's out there, it was almost like a different person. How do you most want your mom to be remembered? She would want to be remembered, obviously, as this great, strong person, as an inspiration to others. Not so much as a great entertainer. She was most proud of just watching, you know, her children. And she lived a very beautiful inspiring life. It, was, it is a life that one could model after. And how would you most like your sister to be remembered? She needs to be remembered as this amazing champion of women. The Star Wars thing it was the vehicle, but the words in her books and the, the surviving of these things that she has survived, like Debbie, carries Molly Brown too, let's face it. Maybe not with the face and the dirt and the tomboy stuff. She's the Molly Brown with the diamonds on the soles of her shoes.